Hear the word of God. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and said, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the, except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all of these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at the statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples, so Jesus told them again, children, it is difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, then it's impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible for God. Peter said to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me, and because of the good news, will receive 100 times as much now in this life. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms with harassment, and in the coming age, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Let us pray. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, we pray. In the name of your beloved. Amen. I was sitting in yet another parent-teacher conference talking with the teacher about the disappointing uh, test results of my son, and I said to my the teacher, felt like my teacher at that moment, but I, I said, but he's smart. He's smart. He just doesn't apply himself. And she smiled and nodded, just as teacher the previous year had smiled and nodded. <laughs> in the same scenario that we were playing out at this very moment. I was sitting in the Wyoming Elementary School hallway with one of my reading buddies, and um, Principal Slater came up and said, hey, how's it going? And I said, great, she's reading to me, she's really smart. And he said, well, I know she's a hard worker, and she works really hard at learning new words. And the harder she works, the more she'll learn. And he turned to her and said, keep up the good work. And then I remembered all of those literature pieces that I had read when my kids were little to talk about action, not ability. So the, the, the articles, as I remember them saying, don't call your kids smart because they can either be smart or not smart. There's just kind of a benchmark. You're either smart or you're not smart. And, and it's, a, it's a state of being. Um, a hard worker, you can be all the time. You can work hard to do things and do your best to make things work. And the harder you work, the better you do. Sometimes hard work is not rewarded with good grades, but it is rewarded generally with learning if you apply yourself. And so uh, encouraging students to be hard workers is something they can achieve continually. Telling them to be smart, they either can or they can't, and it, it, it kind of feels like a helpless situation. There's not a whole lot I can do about it. Either I am smart or I'm not. Hard work generally pays off. And this Labor Day weekend, where we're given a day of rest, 
Thanks to the labor movement, a reward for our hard work, we are looking at a passage that challenges us to do hard work. Today's Bible test, text asks us to be hard workers by giving the example of the rich young ruler who approached Jesus asking for help. This story is a part of a series of teaching stories that um, starts at the end of chapter 8 of Mark, uh, verse 27, and goes through the end of chapter 10 of Mark. Uh, it, it starts with Jesus talking about his suffering, death, and resurrection, followed by the disciples not getting it, followed by Jesus teaching what it means to follow him. So, Jesus talks about suffering, death, and resurrection. Disciples are clueless. Jesus teaches disciples and everyone. Jesus reveals that following him means denying oneself and taking up one's cross. It means losing one's soul in order to save it. It means being like a child in order to enter the kingdom of God. Today's Bible story starts with a man approaching Jesus, asking him what he can do to inherit eternal life, and Jesus quotes to him the commandments. You may have noticed not all ten commandments are quoted. He quotes six or so, maybe, and they are all the commandments that are related to interpersonal relationship, not person-God relationship. It's all the commandments of interpersonal relationships. And the man says he's done all of those commandments. So Jesus challenges him further, not only to follow the letter of the law, but to follow Jesus through radical self-denial and service to others. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you can follow me. And the man, as you know, went away grieving, because he was very rich. Who then can be saved, the disciples wanted to know. With God, all things are possible, Jesus replies. Now, in case you are like me and are always looking for the easy button, looking for the, for the okay, if I just do this one thing, the floodgates will open, right? Right? If I just don't eat M&Ms, the, the pounds will come off. If I just, if I just um, have riveting teaching times, the children will pour in. If I just, it, you know what I mean. I, I, I have this temptation all the time to press the easy button to say, you know, if just one thing happens, everything will fall into place. I don't think that if the man had followed through with selling all he had to the poor, he would have had it made. It wasn't that button that he pushed and then everything would work. Jesus is not looking so much for an action of selling possessions. He's looking for a heart that is willing to sell possessions. It's an attitude, not an action he's looking for. We can have that attitude while retaining some of our possessions. One of the understandings that's Christian, crucial to our Christian walk is to daily remember that we don't own a thing. I was talking this morning with somebody who says, Depression-era parents. I said, I know exactly what you mean. I had Depression-era parents, and they held on to everything because everything can be repaired eventually, right? And it, it's perfectly good, and we can use it at some time. We don't own any of that. My parents are gone. They took none of that with them. Nothing we have is ours forever. Nothing comes with us from this life into the next. All that we have is on loan to us from God. What Jesus really wants us to do is unburden ourselves of whatever might be keeping us relying on God, from relying on God. That may be wealth. That may be something else. And ultimately, we cannot do enough good to merit our salvation. We need to rely on God's mercy for that. And maybe this is a story isn't so much about giving up everything, but about being healed of that man's obsession, of that man's obsession, our obsession, with wealth or whatever gets in the way of following God. This man knelt before Jesus, as many kneel before Jesus. And often when people kneel before Jesus, they are looking for healing. And maybe that's what this man was looking for, healing from his obsession with wealth. You know, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was hyper-focused on perfection and going on to perfection in this lifetime. He didn't mean perfection in the way that we mean perfection. He meant perfection in love. 
It was his hope that every follower of Christ would grow in their love for God and neighbor such that by the end of their life, their demonstrating love for all was second nature. He wrote a letter dated August 26, 1779. Remember, you will be rewarded according to your labor, not according to your success. Meaning that perfection in love was something not to be done once, push the easy button and everything will work. But it was something we need to continually strive for, to continually grow in our love for others. A life of perfect love means living in a way that is centered on God and neighbor. As pastors, when we are standing up in front of the annual conference, and there are a thousand people out there, and we're gathered in the, uh, the convention center at St. Cloud, we're asked by the bishop several historic questions. But two of the historic questions that we're asked is... Are you going on to perfection? And do you expect to be made perfect in love in this lifetime? And the correct answer is, you must guess, yes. You want to be an ordained pastor, you say yes. (laughs) And not lie while saying yes. When we achieve perfection in love, toward all, that doesn't mean we have arrived. It means that for one brief shining moment, we have er arrived briefly at that perfection in love of God and neighbor, and oh, what a glorious moment that is for all. But then the next moment you may stub your toe, or someone will look at you cross-eyed, and then you're, you're, you're not perfectly loving anybody, especially that piece of furniture. A a perfection in life means striving for, working hard, and sometimes at perfection in love. But when we fall from that, we ask for forgiveness, receive forgiveness, and go back to continually working toward perfection in love. And we aren't meant to be a slave to striving. I, I, I've, I've talked about a hard work a lot, and I don't mean that you know we're all going to go out there in the sweat of our brow and it's just going to be drudgery from this day forward. We aren't meant to be a slave to striving, to feel like we are continually failing, but to set before us the goal of seeking God's kingdom, God's government, to rule our lives such that we would find fulfillment in our Christian lives. I've had many a conversation with people who have asked me why I have chosen a profession of Christian leadership. Most of the time, these conversations begin with a childlike understanding of what it means to be Christian, of how God punishes us, is eager to catch us doing wrong, and punish us as soon as we fail. But that's not how our relationship with Christ works. If we are stuck in our childhood's understanding that we're going to get punished for everything we do, of course, when faith is brought up in a conversation, all we want to do is run in the other direction. But my understanding of faith is that it is the best relationship with all, of all, with the best being of all, because it's the relationship with the one who created me, makes me new every day, and best of all, loves me no matter what. Who wouldn't want to be in a relationship like that? Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? That's why those who wait for their come-to-Jesus moments until their deathbed miss out on They miss out on a lifetime relationship with their best friend. Several years ago, I was visiting with an old saint of the congregation. She had had breast cancer about 10 years previous, and um, she had beaten that cancer in her 40s. And then... um, I think it was a good seven years of remission, and then it came back. She beat that cancer, breast cancer, and then about three years later, it came back again. And we were sitting in her living room, and she was, she was very peaceful. She was very much at peace um, with where she was and who she was and what was going on. And uh, she'd gotten all her affairs in order. She'd rewritten the will to write out people who were no longer a part of her family because of divorce or death. And um, she said, you know what? 
I am hoping and praying for a miracle, she said, and I hope that you will pray for that too. But I want you to know no matter what happens, I win. Whether I receive another remission that brings me here, more time here on earth with my grandchildren, or it brings me finally to heaven where I will be welcomed with open arms, it doesn't matter. Either way is perfect. Either way, I win. We talked about what winning would like, winning would look like in either scenario, and then we bowed in prayer, and both of us just sobbed. Such faith in the face of such adversity, and such assurance that what she is doing and who she is and who her God is will ensure that she will win no matter what. Friends, this is perfection in love. God is always with us. God is always for us. This is the hard work we need to do to seek the kingdom of God. For the person of faith, there is never failure. There is always another opportunity to learn of God's presence, recommit to following the God of all creation who loves us no matter what. Either way, we win. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that no matter what happens to us, we win. Help us to seek your kingdom, to seek perfection in love, to seek following you and throwing away the obstacles that come between us and you. Give us strength for the journey. Give us peace with the outcome. In Jesus' name we pray.